body is clothed with worms and scabs. He's a bleeding mess. It's as if there are maggots crawling over his skin as he sits in the rubbish dump. My skin is broken and festering. Don't tell me I need to get right with God. That is unhelpful. Now along comes the second man, the second comforter. His name is Bildad, Bildad the Shuite. He's mean, he's blunt and crude. He's a traditionalist. And in chapter 8, verse 8 and 9, Bildad begins speaking. Ask the former generations and find out what their fathers learned. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing, and our days on earth are but a shadow. So he's saying, in effect, when I was young, we've always done it this way. Look back to our tradition and the way things have been. We're only recently living our lives. Chapter 8 and verse 4. When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. That's cruel. He's saying, you know why your children suddenly were killed? They must have sinned. That's why suddenly God snuffed out their life. Look at chapter 8 and verse 13. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes the hope of the godless. What have you been covering up? Things like this don't happen to good people. They happen to godless people. That's what this man is saying. He's wide of the mark. Look at chapter 8 and verse 20. Surely God does not reject a blameless man or strengthen the hands of evil doers. Well, that's just not true. The innocent do suffer. In the light of the New Testament, who more innocent than the Lamb of God? Rejected and mocked and crucified. The innocent do suffer. The evil do prosper. Wicked tyrants that rule and reign and crush people in their thousands and in their millions. The innocent do suffer. The evil do prosper. It's a mystery. But Bildad is saying, no, they don't. If something happens, then people must have deserved it. He didn't speak into Job's problem. He just aired his philosophical views based on tradition and things handed down to him. Sometimes we can mix up what is New Testament teaching with what our parents have handed down to us and we have grown up with and absorbed and because they were good parents we haven't yet divided between what mum and dad said and the way we were taught and what the book of God says and is biblical truth. The reality with Bildad is Bildad does not know God. He does not know his friend Job and perhaps worst of all he does not know himself. 
The third of the comforters is Zophar. You know, these people get a very bad press, Job's comforters. But I do want to say something on their behalf. I'd like to say a word in their defence. They did come to him and they did sit with him for a week in silence. And when they were with him and kept their mouths shut, because what had happened was so overwhelming, they couldn't take it in, they were helpful to him. When you're going through stuff, to have someone with you and sitting alongside you is a comfort. The difficulty was when they opened their mouths and tried to explain to a man who was reeling why it had happened to him. The third of the comforters was Zophar. The name means a sparrow. And Zophar twitters. He has a mean tongue and he makes some terrible insinuations to Job. Zophar is the legalist. He's got all the answers. He assumes the pious position of being on the inside track with God. So he is candid in what he says, he's hurtful, and he is very dogmatic. Look at chapter 11, Zophar the Naamathite, and verse 5 and 6. This is what he says. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sins. So, in fact, Zophar is saying, listen, Job, you think nothing worse could happen. God's letting you off lightly. Oh, how, how wicked, how dreadful. God has even forgotten some of your sin. You must have been a terrible major league sinner for all this to have happened in your life. It's as if the hell itself has been let loose in your little life. And I want you to know that you're being let off lightly says this very dogmatic legalist. Look at chapter 11 and verse 11. Surely God recognises deceitful men, and when he sees evil, does he not take note? This man has got a scientific mind. He thinks that you can pour life into the test tube and it will always come out a certain way. He says that things can never be changed and that's the way it is. A plus B always equals C and there's never anything else in the calculation. Well, Job's had a skinful by this time. He's heard three men who helped him while they sat there and who've just left him punch drunk. Now they've all had a turn at explaining what's been going on in his life. And they are miles wide of the mark. So in chapter 12,